So one thing that happens often with watch collectors is we always focus on the icons and sometimes forget about all these other great models that might be in a brand's catalog. So today I wanna to look at mainstream luxury brands and pick out some underrated watches, those underrated watches from some of these brands. So what I'm doing here today is looking at about eight brands here. How I'm judging this is for mainstream luxury. I'm looking for brands that are in the industry, uh, are usually in the top 20 in terms of sale numbers, so they're well distributed, people know who they are. So I'm trying to get into those really popular tiers. And I'm also looking at models that are often overlooked. Partially what I'm doing to judge this, just so I can get different brands in here, is where is there a large discrepancy? I wanna look at Rolex as an example here today. Of course, many people will say all Rolex models are not underrated, but if there is a discrepancy from the Submariner from another collection, I think that's fair play. So that's how I'm also judging this. I'm gonna pick one watch from each brand. And also this is going to come down to some of my subjective opinion as well. So, you know, this is just my take. Also, if you wanna know more things about the watch industry, the different brands that make up it, we have a very comprehensive guide looking at 50 of the leading watch brands in the mechanical watch industry. And really the goal of that is to be a crash course on understanding these brands more efficiently, uh, knowing the different models that are in their collection, some backstory of the history, also some fun facts associated with the brand and their parent organization and how they're operated. Check it out, link will be in the description down below. Over 50 brands covered in that article. It's a long read, but definitely worth it. Now, first up here, we have Breitling. And for a point of reference for a model that I'm looking at and trying to find that disparity, and uh, gap between, it's going to be with the Navitimer. That is definitely the most thought about model from the brand. From there, you can think of a few different options. I did not want to go with something like the Chronomat because I think that has its own defining characteristic with its bracelet. And many people, I think, do love the Chronomat. Not to say this model here that I decided on is overlooked or maybe not a great watch, because I think it certainly is, but maybe not getting as much love in the crowded field of chronographs from Breitling. And that is the premier collection from Breitling, mostly with the Premier B01. So the Premier collection and the word Premier has been used in Breitling's catalog and first appeared in the 1940s. So it's not anything necessarily new, but since uh, we've seen the reemergence of Breitling and kind of refocus of Breitling in the last five years, one of the models that they did try to reposition most effectively uh, was this Premier collection. It really sits as that hybridized approach to driving and everyday style of chronograph, most commonly associated with its Panda style dial, has a B01 movement on the inside, 100 meters of water resistance for this B01 that we're looking at here. 42 millimeter case, but does wear pretty true to that size. Uh, lug to lug is reasonable at 49 and a half millimeters. Uh, sapphire crystal, you have a variety of different options that you can go for now. And we also did recently see the unveiling of probably one of my favorite Breitlings out there, along with those new Navitimers in different sizes, this B09, this pistachio color dial. I think this is absolutely beautiful. Part of the Premier collection. It does have a manual wound caliber on the inside, which does help with the thickness and allowing this one to wear much smaller on the wrist. I think from the looks perspective, I think these are some very tasteful looking chronographs. Uh, they are a bit Bit challenging when it comes to price compared to the very busy luxury chronograph segment, but still one to consider. I think one overlook from Breitling. Now, next up, we have Omega. They are ranked third in the Swiss watchmaking industry in terms of total turnover based on 2021 data. But the models, of course, that people commonly will associate with the brand, for one, Seamaster Diver 300 meter, but the other one, of course, the Speedmaster. So the model I wanna look at here is a personal favorite of mine. I don't really get why this model doesn't get more love because I think it's a great everyday style watch. It does lean a tad dressy with its fluted bezel, but that is the Omega Globemaster. Now I'm a lover of the Constellation family and this is technically underneath the Constellation collection. This was unveiled in 2015. And really what makes this watch special are a few things. One is it starts to bring back the design and style of those C-case co constellations from the mid 20th century with the fluted bezel design. Some people might look at this and be like, it's a fluted bezel, they're copying Rolex. Well, Omega did have their own history with using uh, fluted bezels and it has more of this fine fluted effect to it that is very much their style. Also, what's really interesting about this one is with the movement and then also the material of that bezel. So the bezel first made of tungsten carbide. This is used in a lot of military weapons and is very scratch resistant. One of the most dense and also scratch resistant materials that is used in watchmaking. So not only is this going to have this polished effect to it that's going to look the part, it's also not going to chip away like maybe if you use a precious metal like gold. And then the other point that I'll mention with the Globemaster, which I think is very cool, when this was unveiled, this was actually the introduction of the uh, Meta certified uh, movements on the inside. So this is the 8900 caliber. Uh, this is the two barrel movement, coaxial escapement, but also was the first to uh, 
uh, actually showcase the master chronometer certification, which has now become pervasive in the entire Omega catalog. Uh, but this also was of note because of just the Constellation line. This was the watch that became really that chronometer style watch. It was uh, really known for their high performance movements. Also the observatory case back, those stars above are going to be indications of Omega during those chronometer trials during the first half of the 20th century and their wins there. This is available in a variety of dial colors and an annual calendar version, which I think is very well positioned in terms of pricing. Some people don't like the script on the dial, which I can understand, but I absolutely adore this watch. I own one personally. I think it represents a lot of things I love from Omega. I love the Constellation line with its pie pan dial. It integrates that, but also the movement, the tungsten bezel. It's just a cool package. For our next brand here, we have JLC. JLC, commonly known for the Reverso, of course. You probably can mention any collection outside of the Reverso, but the model for me that I think has not only been overlooked, but also probably has some of the most potential of almost any luxury sports watch, the Polaris. JLC is so well positioned for what they offer as a brand. To me, I don't understand why they are not more popular other than the fact that they do tend to lean into more uh, dress oriented watches, which isn't necessarily in right now. But if you're talking about well positioned brands, JLC has to be one of the best, especially from the Richemont group. I think they're uh, remarkable in what they're offering up. Now the Polaris is a model that has, of course, immense history. If you look at those Polaris memo boxes uh, from the mid 20th century that were unveiled, you had those different alarms. It was a really cool, catalog of models that you can look at. So the version that we have here is this JLC Polaris date. It's loosely based on the original Memovox deep sea alarm from 1959 but you also have some different versions, just the standard Polaris uh, 41 that is more oriented to the everyday style of things. This comes with that 200 meters of water resistance. Now we're getting newer upgraded movements with that extended power reserve. JLC was a tad behind the industry norm of 70 hours for some time, but now bringing it into the forefront with this new collection of calibers. Inside this one, you have the 899. And in addition, these watches are coming in under $10,000. So you're basically in at retail price in that Rolex Submariner territory. You're getting a watch with tremendous history. You have this dual crown design in this instance, which is unique and I would say one of the models that has led with that format has been the Polaris. And of course, maybe not the most beautiful movements that you're going to find, but JLC almost sets that standard of what a luxury movement should be in this $10,000 price range with these 899 calibers. Now, next up here, we have Rolex. I know some people are going to say, how could you have Rolex in a video like this? But I'm looking at a disparity between the most popular model and something that's maybe not as popular. And I think Rolex does have a wide spectrum of different collections and the popularity towards some versus others is drastically different. I had a few different options here that I could choose from. At the, of course, popular end, you have things like the Submariner and the Daytona probably setting the stage, maybe even the Datejust as another one to mention with the GMT Master II. I would say at the less popular end, you have the Cellini, of course, but I wanna to go towards a sports collection just because, again, this is my list, I can be subjective. Looking at either the Milgauss or the Explorer 2, but the Explorer 2 wins out because that's probably one of my favorite collections from Rolex. You can look at this entire collection. Ever since this collection was unveiled with the 1655 in 1971, it's been the second fiddle to the Explorer and maybe even the GMT Master 2 with its dual time zone functionality. I simply adore the Explorer 2. Uh, the polar dials, typically the ones that I will go for. Although the 226-570 is the modern creation of the Explorer 2 family, I personally like the 1990s uh, 16570s. I own one of those. I like the 40 millimeter case. To me, it just fits that nice middle ground of wearability. Now these are enlarged out to 42 millimeters. Still beautiful watches. Uh, one of my favorite modern collections along with the GMT Master II, uh, the Explorer, and the Milgauss. I'd say those are probably my top four uh, favorite Rolex models. But uh, this is just, to me, the enthusiast choice along with the Cellini, but I think many people when they think of Rolex think of their sports collection. This and the Milgauss are probably the ones from the sports collection that don't get as much love and are sometimes the enthusiast options. But one of the reasons why I like the Explorer 2 along with the Milgauss probably being two of the most underlooked uh, watches from the brand when it comes to the sports catalog is they don't have this blingy effect that many of the other models have. The Explorers, especially the Explorer 2, with that fixed bezel, it has this more uh, utilitarian approach to it, which 
has uh, certainly been a feeling that Rolex has abandoned as of late with many of their modern creations, but I think it just makes these almost more endearing. And when someone does decide to pick a watch like this or the Milgauss, uh, it just, to me, feels like somebody that is just buying it because they like the watch more than maybe the status that comes along with it. This is why I would say the Explorers as well as the Milgauss and the GMT Master 2, just because I like it, are probably my top contemporary models from Rolex. So when you think of Tudor nowadays, you do think of the Tudor Black Bay. You have the GMTs, you have the 58s, you have the chronographs, you have the traditional heritage models. There are so many to choose from now. So I would say those, of course, are the most popular. So what's something on the other end that maybe doesn't get as much love? There are quite a few. You've seen over the years some things tail out. I want to look at a model that is still in the collection. So unfortunately, no Ranger. Can't look at something like the North Flag. Uh, this model does seem to be following the same fate. At the time of recording this, I remember seeing it on the website but maybe that's changed even since, looking at the Heritage Chrono from Tudor. Now, why the Heritage Chrono uh, from Tudor is cool to me and is probably that underrated watch from the brand is because it also is a model that is reflective of Tudor's history. It's one of the only models in the 20th century from Tudor that was absolutely isolated in its own identity from Rolex. When you had those Monte Carlo references from the early 1970s, that design was so Tudor and they almost set the mold and standard for what those colorful, playful 70s chronographs and just divers that you would see uh, to come years after. They certainly were near the front of the pack when it came to setting that now standard that many people expect when they look back to the 1970s and thinking about all these playful and uh, more eccentric types of color arrays. Now these watches came before the Black Bay Chrono when these were introduced in the earlier 2010s. So when they were unveiled, they released with an ETA 2892 with a Dubois de Praz module instead of using the B01 that was before that technology was exchanged with Breitling. So you do get a modular chronograph system, making the price of around $4,500 a tough pill to swallow for some uh, compared to what you could get for the Chrono, spend a little bit more money with that iconic Black Bay design now. But again, this is a model that to me is a defining model from Tudor's history. It has an unmistakable look to it that is one of the rare instances where Tudor, before before re-emerging with the Black Bay had an exercise of their own creativity and being unique from their sister brand Rolex. So now for another industry giant with Patek Philippe. At the far end, we're the popular side, looking where we're having our reference. We have things like the Nautilus, the Aquanaut, some of their perpetual calendars and chronographs that you could look at. But there is another model from Patek that is very historically important, but also I would say overlooked from a modern context, and that is with the Ellipse. So the Ellipse is defined by its case shape and being this oval approach and also having reference to this idea of the golden ratio, an ancient formula symbolizing beautiful harmony and balance in architecture and in the arts. Its silhouette of its case in perfect proportions has been a defining characteristic. But when this watch was unveiled in the late 1960s, it also was defining in some other ways. One was its silhouette design. There were, of course, other brands out there doing things like this, but it was really one of the leaders there and also in adopting color. If you look at a lot of watches before 1950 or 1960, many of them were more just white, silver, black dials, and that was really the end of it. There wasn't much more exploring into different colors. The Ellipse was one of those few models that started to sample with different dial colors, most often associated with its blue dial, which is my favorite, now available in platinum. You have a gold option as well available in the modern collection. I think the reason why this is, of course, overlooked is going to be because of its dainty type of size. You have a 34.5 millimeter case here and a lug to lug of 39.5 millimeters. So with that in mind, it does not maybe meet the current standards of what I would say many people are going for that purchase a Patek Philippe watch, but a model that of course is the epitome of class and probably overlooked. And now next up we have Vacheron Constantin. For the popular side of the brand, many people are going to think of the overseas. This has become more of a phenomenon of the industry widely adapting and uh, wanting the integrated sports watch look and the overseas being that watch that's available from the brand. Then you can look at the historique collection with things like the 1921 and the Corn de Vache, of course, being uh, huge fixtures in their history as well as their design DNA. And then you also have the dress category, mostly associated with the patrimony and its clean uh, approach and layout uh, for a dress watch. But my personal favorite and watch that I think is overlooked, even though it is a fixture in their collection, is the Traditionnel. I think it has always run as the 1B to some of the historique models, as well as the Patrimony collection. And I just love the dial and approach to this watch. It is 
a tad more contemporary than the Patrimony. The Patrimony, uh, Patrimony is more minimalist, uses a lot of uh, s more like, subdued type of approaches to finishing, as well as the small linear markings. The Tradition now is more stark and also a bit more imposing in terms of how it approaches its design. You have also those Dauphine hands at the center, which is probably my favorite characteristic of this watch. You have a polished one side and the other side is going to be kind of brushed, blasted, and it creates this very cool contrast effect that helps with legibility. My favorite version is probably the Batik edition that they unveiled. It has this remarkable texturized surface with that traditional traditional format uh, that I just absolutely love. We also have perpetual calendars. We saw one of those recently with that new salmon dial that was unveiled at Watches and Wonders this year, where I actually sat down with Christian Salmoni and we talked about that watch in more detail. So recommend checking that out, but have always loved the tradition now. Probably one of my favorite entry-level high horology dress watches and one that from the brand, although not, maybe not so overlooked, maybe is not mentioned as much as the Patrimonies and looking at something like the American 1921. But all right, guys, that is my list here today, looking at some less popular watches from popular luxury brands. Which ones do you agree with? Which ones do you disagree with? And also, what are some other brands that you would also throw into the mix and what's your pick on the unpopular watches that should get more love? Love to see comments down below. Also, if you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe and hit the bell icon, would appreciate that. Definitely check out teddybaldesar.com, full authorized dealer of 30 brands, quick and fast fulfillment, dedicated customer support, full factory warranty for all the products that we offer. Definitely check out Instagram to see some great photos of watches, stay up to date with the content in the process and subscribe to our weekly newsletter. We have written content being sent to you every single week. It's totally different than the watch content that we're creating here on YouTube. But guys, thank you again so much for watching. Be well, and I will see you all very soon.